officially brought our drought to an end and the days left in August will uh, August will lose its straight hold on the summer and leave us on the doorstep of fall so looking forward to that I'd like to uh, before I start give an assist to Mr. Allen for helping me with my audio visual portion of this morning's opening as you can see, there are two dogs on the screen, one with mud to his knees and one to his neck. That uh, brings me to my theme this morning, it's perspective. Is the mud deep? Well, it depends on who you ask. Are your problems big? It depends on who you ask. The uh, mine problem may be a mountain, yours might be an anthill, we have the same problem. But it's based upon my perspective of the problem and my life experiences and my relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. The Lord says, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. So when you see someone struggling, try not to view their problems from your perspective because the two don't match up. So if you would join me in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for being with us today and allowing us to come to your house and worship you would uh, ask that you be with those individuals who can't be with us here this morning and join those who uh, are with us via the World Wide Web. Ask that you place your hand on those individuals that need your presence in their life. And as we start this week, give us the strength and guidance to deal with our problems, whether it be knee deep or neck deep. And dear Lord, we love you with all our heart. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Well, today's theme in the hymns will be in revival, or revive us again. But I just recall as a child growing up, our junior high student then, um, in Little Rock, and then moving to Jonesboro, but in the Southern Baptist Church, we always had two revivals every year one in the spring, one in the fall. I remember one in particular evangelist that came in. His name was Angel Martinez. Never used the Bible because he had it all memorized. And just go right through. And it was amazing. I remember a second one was in Jonesboro. And it was out on the Craighead County uh, Fairgrounds. It was a tent revival and opened up to anyone. And as the service went on, lightning bolts were coming down. <laughs> The storm was moving in. It came a tremendous storm. The men got up and held the poles down, but we still had a good revival and got out of there and went home. <laughs> so, uh, 
been a great experience. So now turn to 295, revive us again. 295, let's stand.
2293, rise up, O Church of God. <laughs> today and uh, some are traveling some are a little under the weather uh, but we uh, our minds are with them uh, wherever they might be today we are going to go to the Lord in prayer but before I do that I want to share a couple of praise reports uh, for the last uh, couple of months uh, Jane has been battling uh, with one of her eyes and uh, had some surgery on it and uh, there was some uh, fears that she might lose sight in that eye and she came to me this morning and said I can see 50% in that eye and so that's a long way from where it was and trending in the right direction and so we want to continue to pray that uh, full sight will be restored to Jane, and we're thankful for that report today. Uh, also, uh, Becky Lott uh, went to see her doctor uh, this past week, and the doctor released her, said that she was doing so well that uh, he would not need to see her again, and uh, she will still have follow-up with uh, some of her other physicians. But not only did they release her, but they told her that it was okay for her to come to church. <laughs> now, we've been waiting for that news for a long time. And uh, she's not here today. Uh, hopefully, she will be here next Sunday. But I need your help in order for her to come back. Because the doctor said that while she could come to church, he did not want her shaking hands or hugging necks. Boy, she just goes to the wrong church, doesn't she? <laughs> because we like to shake hands and we like to hug necks. But I, I think we could sacrifice that for Becky to be back uh, in service, in person with her family of faith. And so she's probably going to come in just a uh, a couple of minutes after service begins and uh, she may need to leave just a couple of minutes before we're dismissed uh, or we just need to be disciplined and just wave at her from a distance 
but that is wonderful, wonderful news. And uh, we thank the Lord for that. So hopefully we'll be seeing uh, Becky back in service with us real soon. Um, now to our prayer needs. Uh, Ken Kane told me that his daughter-in-law is not doing well. Her name is Dixie. She has been on our prayer list for a while, uh, undergoing treatments for cancer. And uh, they are going to be looking at going to another facility uh, for treatment. And so let's amp up those prayers for Dixie. Also, please be in prayer for my uh, nephew, that the Lord would be with him and his family in their journey. Um, also, all of the others that are on our prayer list, we want to be faithful and diligent in lifting them up to the Lord. Uh, also, we want to pray for Alma Holman. That is uh, Bill Bergman's mother-in-law. Alma had back surgery, and then while... Uh, recuperating from that had a heart attack and so she's in the hospital in Springfield uh, she is critical but stable and so uh, both Bill and Joyce reached out to me and asked for our prayers for Alma so we want to certainly do that also I realize that uh, school has already started for some uh, but West Plains uh, school districts and I think the surrounding uh, rural schools begin tomorrow and so we want to be in prayer for all of the students for all of the teachers and administrators faculty and staff that God would be with them and bless them and give them a great year uh, also for those that are headed off to college pray for their parents <coughs> Uh, our granddaughter went to uh, check in on Thursday and the email or the text that I got from Justin after they dropped her off and were headed home, it just simply said, well, that sucked. <laughs> and then uh, my sister, uh, her grandson, uh, they dropped him off at uh, Arkansas State yesterday. So there were a lot of tears shed this past week as moms and dads and grandparents had to uh, face a new chapter in the life of their child or grandchild. But uh, we know that that's just a part of life and it'll all be fine and uh, they will do well. And uh, we're thankful that they have a foundation on which to stand that will guide them and help them uh, in this new venture in their life. And so we have uh, some teachers and uh, school folks here uh, in our church, and uh, we are praying for you. We're encouraging you. I realize that uh, right now uh, across the United States, uh, teachers are declining, and there's different reasons for that. And uh, some are just overworked and burned out and, and uh, underpaid and underappreciated. And uh, I want you to know that this church appreciates you for what you do. And we will encourage you and support you in every way that we can. If you have a need today, if you would acknowledge it by an uplifted hand, we'll take our cares to the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be in your presence today. Thank you that where two or three gather together in your name, that you come among them. And Lord, we want to fellowship with you today. Just as we pray that we are ministered to, Lord, we want to minister to you through our thanksgiving and through our worship today. Father, we thank you for the great praise reports and all that you have done and continue to do. And Lord, we just give you praise for that today. And uh, we thank you for allowing us to bring our petitions to you. And so we lift up Dixie today, asking Lord that you would minister to her. Lord, that you would minister to her family, that you would just supply 
all of their needs. Father, I pray for Hayes today and his family, that you would uh, be with them in this journey. Pray for Tammy, that you would continue to be with her and Bruce. And Father, all of those that are on our prayer list today, we pray for Alma, asking God for your hand of protection to be over her as she's in the hospital. Lord, that she will uh, have a full recovery, that you would strengthen her today. Every need acknowledged by an uplifted hand, you know what every one of those uh, represented today. And Lord, we just place those in your care, asking, Lord, that you would minister uh, according to your will. Father, today we lift up uh, our students, our teachers, all administrators, staff, faculty, uh, everyone that uh, is tasked with taking care of our children uh, in an educational setting. We pray for them, those that have already uh, gone to school, those that are going to be entering the classrooms tomorrow. I pray, Lord, that you would be with them, that you would strengthen them, that you would encourage them today. Lord, that you would help them to see anew their value. Father, I pray for a community that will support them and help them in any way that we can. And Lord, I just pray that this would be a year that is blessed. I pray, God, it would be uh, an environment that is safe and conducive to learning. Father, I just give you praise today, asking you to be with your people wherever they are gathered today. Let the church be lifted up encouraged, and at the same time, let us be challenged to be better than we were yesterday. And we'll give you all of the praise, all of the glory, for it's in the name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I'm going to sing today. Uh, I had another song that that uh, I was going to try to sing. But last night, uh, as we got ready to go to bed, the lightning was flashing and thunder was rolling. And uh, At that point, it hadn't began to rain, but it wasn't long uh, after we got in bed that I, I heard the rain on the roof. And uh, throughout the night, I would wake up and hear it thundering and, and raining and storming. And uh, this song came to my mind. And, uh, you know, uh, natural storms can be symbolic of personal storms. And uh, we all have them. At some point in our life, it becomes our turn to uh, face some, some dark times in life. And uh, so I hope uh, this song will minister to you today. It, it was such a, a comfort to... Uh, just sort of uh, sing it in my mind last night as the storms raged outside. And so I hope it will minister to you today.
bring me low, but never bring me down. I know the master of the wind. I know the maker of the rain. He can calm the storms, make the sun shine again. I know the master of the wind. I know the master of the wind I know the maker of the rain He can calm the storms make the sun shine again I know the master of the wind He can calm the storms Make the sun shine again. I know the master of the wind. Dismiss our kids, the sunshine kids, this morning. What a great looking crew we have today. Miss Kelly will have something especially for you. If you have your Bibles today, we're turning to the book of 1 Samuel. That's in the Old Testament. First Samuel chapter 17. First Samuel 17, verse 38 and 39. So Saul clothed David with his armor put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. And that is not indicating the uh, existence of the postal service. Clothed him with a coat of mail. A coat of mail was a long defensive garment that was made of interlinked metal rings or metal plates for protection. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. My message today, wear what fits. Wear what fits. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, today that within the pages of Holy Writ, we find direction, we find encouragement, we find guidance. I pray, Lord, that you would open our ears to hear your word today. Open our hearts to receive it. Give us courage to put it into practice. Father, I pray that you would help me to uh, minister those things that uh, you have placed in my heart to share today. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. We are all very familiar with the story of the shepherd boy David and his conquest of Goliath. Sent to the front lines by his father Jesse to carry food to his brothers, put him on a direct course to confront the hero of the Philistines. 
And with the assurance that God was with him, David fell the giant with a stone, beheads him with his own sword, and saves the Israelite nation. The biblical account of David and Goliath is one of the most popular stories from all of Scripture. It's lessons of courage and faith and overcoming what seemingly was impossible has captured, has captured the imaginations of every child that has heard the story told. But before the climax of this great victory, embedded into the narrative of the story is a subplot. After David had accepted Goliath's challenge, King Saul tried to make David look and act like a soldier. He, he tried to dress him in armor, even giving him his own, also giving him his sword and a shield. But David was a mere boy. King Saul was a grown man. David was just a young shepherd. The sword was too big. The armor was too heavy. Once he got it on, David couldn't even walk in it, much less go to battle, encumbered by all of that. And, and so David took off the garments of a soldier put back on his shepherd's clothes. And he went to find things that were more familiar to him. And so with his staff in his hand and knowing that he is about to confront Goliath, he makes his way down into the valley and there was a brook. So David stops long enough to take five smooth stones from the clear water and put them in his bag. And with his sling ready, he went out to meet the giant, who was a very experienced, a very formidable warrior. And as they say, the rest is history. Now David was given all of the things that a soldier would need to defeat Goliath. But David was not a soldier. David was a shepherd. He didn't fit into a soldier's clothing. They simply weren't who he was. He, he was a shepherd, and if he was going to win this battle, it would have to be as a shepherd. And so David wore what fit him, and he succeeded. Now, perhaps aside from faith and assurance in God's ability, there's another lesson in this story for us to learn today. And that is, if we want to fulfill God's purpose for our lives, then we should become comfortable wearing the clothes that fit us. We, we should strive to just simply be the individual that God has called us to be. Because every one of us here today are called by God to fulfill His purpose in our lives. And every one of us have been given gifts and talents to use for the glory of God. And yet, 
There are many who are tempted to wear the clothes that we already know will not fit. We've seen it played out in real life, and if we're honest, probably some of us have been guilty of this ourselves. A mother tries to encourage her daughter to wear a stethoscope because being a physician has excellent career opportunities. But what the daughter would really like to do is try on the costume of an actress to pursue her career in theater. A father wants his son to wear the uniform of an athlete. <clears throat> wants him to stand out in baseball or football or basketball or any of the other kind of balls. But the son wants to play a trumpet and march in the band wearing the uniform of a band member. A husband wants his wife to wear an apron and be a stay-at-home mom. But what she'd really like to do is go back to school and get her degree and wear the attire fitting of a teacher. Or a wife wants her husband to wear a business suit. To move up on the corporate ladder. But what he really feels called to do is to work with children. And, and, and so he'd like to be able to put on a scout leader's uniform every morning and work with the kids of the community. You see, society promotes through advertising and through the mass media that we are all supposed to wear the clothing of successful people. <clears throat> And for too many, it has only led to living lives that are stressful and frustrated and void of meaning because success is defined by what we have instead of who we are. And so we're so busy chasing a contentment that so easily evades us because we're trying to be something that God never intended or gifted us to be. That is true in our natural lives. It's also true in our spiritual lives. And it must have been an issue for the first century church as well. It would seem by reading the scriptures that uh, there were those in the early church who were trying to be something that they were not gifted to be. To both the church at Rome and in his second letter to the church at Corinth, Paul teaches them by liking the body of Christ to a natural body. He explains to them the fact that the body has many parts, but that every part has a different function. And one part should not be complaining because they view themselves as being less significant than another. He, he declared that every part is necessary to the benefit of the whole. And, and that God has set each one of them in the body just as he pleases. <clears throat> and, and so Paul tells them, if your gift is in prophecy, then prophesy. If God has gifted you to be a leader, than to lead with diligence. If God's gift for you is to teach, then teach. If God has given you the gift to give, then give with liberality. However God has gifted you, 
use that to the edifying or to the building up of others. And if that's true, then just the opposite of that is true. If God did not gift you to prophesy, then don't try prophesying. If God did not give you the talents and the gifts to be a leader, then be satisfied with being a follower. Whatever God has given you to do, do that. I've had people ask me through the years how they could identify what their gift was. And I think what they really wanted was for me to tell them what their gift was. As if somehow I could spiritually discern the talents that God had given uniquely to them. And so I would always tell them to go home and look in the mirror. And to see the reflection that was looking back at them for simply what it was. Just see the person that God uniquely made them to be. <clears throat> and it really is that simple. God, God doesn't make it complicated. Everything that God created was done with a unique purpose in mind. God doesn't ask a dog to be a cat. God doesn't require an apple tree to bear peaches. He didn't make it to be a peach tree. He made it to be an apple tree. I, I want to show you just how simple this concept is. In the book of Job, chapter 37, the Bible says this. God's voice thunders in marvelous ways. He does great things beyond our understanding. He says to the snow, fall to the earth. And to the rain shower be a mighty downpour. So God says to the snow, fall on the earth. Just do one thing. Just fall. And then he says to the rain shower, be a mighty downpour. Uh, essentially, what he's saying is just do the thing I've actually created you to do. Your rain, so rain. Your snow, so snow. And, and when we can see the simplicity in that, a tremendous weight is taken off of our shoulders. God's asking me to be the thing he's already created me to be. Nothing more. God's asking you to be the thing that he's already created you to be. Nothing more. He, he doesn't tell the snow to thaw and become rain. He doesn't tell the rain to freeze and turn itself into snow. And I know what you're thinking. That at their core, both of them are water. <coughs> exactly. But with different form and different functions. <coughs> Remember what Paul said to Rome and Corinth? We're one body. Members in particular. And we all function uniquely. And so God says, do your thing. Do what I've created you to do. 
There are so many that twist themselves up in knots and all because they're trying to be something or someone else. They, they try to fulfill some endless list of qualities and capabilities that they think will make them feel loved or happy. That's a very exhausting way to live. And I know because I've tried it. As a young minister, and, and please don't think that I'm not for trying to better oneself to become a little bit more knowledgeable and, and uh, educated. Early on in my ministry, I, I purposed that I was going to learn a new word every week and figure out how to use it in a sermon. And these weren't little words. These were big words. Because I wanted to look more learned. A little bit more refined. And I got put in my place one Sunday evening while preaching. I, I was preaching about how the devil tempts us. And the things that he tempts us with. And I made the statement that Satan thinks he has a diamond. When all he really has is a cubic zirconia. Now today that doesn't seem all that <laughs> radical. Because cubic zirconia has been around a while. But back then they were pretty new. And this little lady sitting next to another little old lady who thought she was whispering <laughs> turned to her and said, what's that? Because she had no idea that a cubic zirconian was just simply a fake diamond. And there was something that struck my spirit. In that how can I preach if people don't understand what I'm saying? What good did it do me to learn those words that some people had no idea what I said after I said it? I, I just finally realized that I'm who I am. I, I'm just a, a country boy. I've got a high school education. I didn't attend seminary. I've got a few hours from uh, doing a few course studies in, in Bible school, but uh, I, I'm just an old country boy. And uh, I like to say ain't and y'all. <laughs> and that's just who I am. And, and I, I've had people, and, and I've learned to take it as a compliment I've had people say to me before, I, I just really enjoy your preaching because you, you just talk so I can understand it. And isn't that what we're called to do? To be able to communicate? As a minister, isn't my calling to be able to communicate the gospel in a way that people can understand it? In a way that when you leave here, you, you feel uplifted. You feel like you, you've spent some quality time and, and you've heard something from the Lord and you can take that and use it for the week. You see, it, it got to be a little weary trying to be something that I wasn't. I, I would listen to other ministers that, that I considered to be great, great preachers and think that if I could just be like them, if I could just copy their mannerisms, then, then surely that would make me better. And all the while God was saying, Rick, I didn't make you to be like them. I made you to be like you. And if you'll just be like you, I'll do the rest. 
And I think sometimes we all get caught up in that. When all the while God's asking us to just be who he created and gifted us to be. Within this one body of believers that we call First Christian Church, we have a wonderful diversity of talents. We're teachers, plumbers, electricians, doctors, farmers, realtors, business owners. We're housewives, secretaries, nurses, law enforcement officers, truck drivers, engineers, student, sales clerks, contractors, retirees. Do you get the picture? Do you even have a preacher among you? I didn't know if I was going to do this today or not, but I got a, I got a few minutes to work with. So I'm going to do it. The Bible says to give honor where honors do. And uh, sometimes I don't think I do a good enough job at that. Uh, I won't embarrass them, but uh, I, I need them to come up here in order for me to make this work. And, and so I, I don't think it'll embarrass them. But uh, Jason... For those of you that do not know his uh, full name, this is Jason Harrell. Uh, come over here a little bit, I'll get you on TV. This is your moment. This is your moment to shine and just wave at everybody out there. Uh, there are some things that, that I've observed over the last several years of being Jason's pastor. I've observed that he's a, a great husband to his wife, Ashley. He's a great father Amen. to his daughters. I think he's a good teacher. I don't know. I've never sat in one of his classes, but I would say he's a good teacher. But one thing that he's really great at is being a coach. If you follow him on Facebook, he is an encourager to every athlete that has come up under him. He's at Junction Hill School, one of our rural schools, only go to the eighth grade. But he doesn't stop there. He follows them through high school and then even into college. And he's had some students that he has, uh, that he has built the foundation for that has gone on to play at higher levels. The reason he does that is because that's what God gifted him to do. Gifted him to be a coach. Didn't gift him to be a pulpit minister. Although I'm sure if he put his mind to it, he could probably do that. Probably better than if I put my mind to it, I could be a coach. But he just goes to work every day. He gets up every day to do what God has gifted him to do. Be a good husband. Be a good father. Be a good teacher. Be a great coach. It's just that simple. And, and I could have brought up others of you. But this past week when I was preparing, God just put Jason on my heart. And, and I commend him today. And I thank him for being uh, the kind of coach that he is, the encourager. And uh, I, I think we ought to honor him today. Would you give him a <laughs>
And, and so I, I could pull others out and, 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 and talk about how every day you go about being who God created you to be. And, and here's the thing that we all have in common. Every one of us are needed in order to make life work. And so God's message for us today is to become content with who God made us to be. And, and simply to do the often mundane, repetitive things that our gifts allow us to do with this twist. As followers of Jesus, we are to heed the admonition of Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. There is a tremendous value in embracing the loves and the skills and the passions that God has planted inside of us. And that value only increases when those things are used in a way that is reflective of Christ. And so like David, let's wear what fits. Let's just be who God made us to be. And then watch God do great things through us. So wherever life takes you this afternoon or tomorrow, if it's in an office building, if it's out among the public, wherever that might be, whatever your day might look like, do it with a little more kindness, do it with more compassion, and do it with a lot of grace. And you just might be surprised at what God will do through you. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for reminding us that we do not have to be great because you're great. We don't have to always have it all together because you always have it all together. And yet, Lord, you've reminded us that no matter how insignificant we may see ourselves, we are vital to the health of the body. Lord, we work hand in hand. All of the functions work together for the good of the whole. So, Lord, today... While we might not think that we're that significant in the overall scope of things, help us to see our value. Help us to see that you made us unique and that we can do what others cannot do. We can reach certain people that other people would never reach. Lord, I pray that you use us all today for your glory and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you to the table of the Lord today. If you did not receive a communion packet when you came in this morning, if you'll raise your hand, our elder will make sure that you have one. We need some right up here in the front. I think maybe they had some behind them stored up for a rainy day.
Anybody else need one? They've been taken care of, Edward. Well, thank you. I'm thankful for this moment and we can all come together as a body of believers, as a family of faith. There's nothing like gathering around the table, is there? I always enjoy our time with family and especially when we gather around the table to share a meal together. Some of my greatest experiences in life have been at the table with my mom and dad and siblings and kids and Thanksgivings and Christmases and all of those special times when we have gathered and laughed and reminisced and made memories that stay with us for years and years and years. It's the way I feel this morning at the table of the Lord. To think that a king would invite us to his table and there to remind us of how much we are loved. Today as we gather, I hear the words of Jesus to his disciples. He said, I will not do this again with you. Because he knew that his time upon earth was quickly coming to a close. But he said, I, I'm going to do this so that you'll remember. So that 2,000 years from now, you can gather together as a group called First Christian Church. You can take of emblems that will remind you that I loved you while you were yet a sinner. And I went to the cross to atone for your sin. That through me, you have the hope of everlasting life in the place that I go to prepare for you. And he said, believe me, I will return and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be. But until that day, Remember me. With bread, remember my body that is broken for you. And with juice, remember my blood that was shed on your behalf. And so on the night that he would be betrayed, Jesus took bread. He blessed it. He broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. And likewise, he took the cup, blessed it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink all of it. This is my, the new covenant in my blood shed for you. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again that we have been able to sit at your feet for a little while this morning to hear of your word. Lord, to be helped in our endeavor to be more like you. And Lord, what greater way to end this service than to gather at your table to partake with each other these emblems that not only are reminders, but they're emblems that unite us in our faith. There is no Savior but you. No gospel but yours that is able to save us, to keep us, and to help us as we endeavor to live lives that are reflective of you. 
Lord Jesus, today I pray that you would bless your people. Lord, I pray that you would be blessed by us today. Father, I pray that this week you would help all of us to be able to share our gifts and our talents with others that they might see you in our lives. Father, keep us in your care is our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Larry's going to come and lead us in our closing hymn today. I invite us all to stand and sing along with him. Take your hymn on and turn to hymn number 294. Set my soul afire, 294. <laughs>
if you get a chance, pat him on the back and tell him happy birthday. Uh, Kevin, you keep on, you'll catch up with me. <laughs> God bless you all. Thank you for being here today. May the Lord go and be with each one of you and bless you and allow you to be a blessing to others this week. As we're dismissed today, let's pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.